This video was completed before the tragic loss of the Orbiter Columbia and her crew in February 2003. We dedicate this program to the brave men and women who lost their lives in the quest for outer space. Have you ever looked up into the night sky and wondered what's out there? Beyond our Earth are distant stars, planets, and galaxies. Through the ages, people have dreamed about what it would be like to travel in space. In rockets? You can build model rockets like this space shuttle and launch them into the sky. Get ready! Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, blast off! Model rockets are fun, but would you like to see real ones? Yeah! Our adventure begins here, at the Kennedy Space Center in Titusville, Florida. The Space Center is located on a barrier island in the Atlantic Ocean. Shuttle Launch Control is located here. This is Launch Complex 39, where the shuttle flies into space. Here's the shuttle landing strip, the longest runway in the world. And these are launch pads for other rockets that send satellites into space. Much of the Space Center is a preserve for wildlife. The island is home to lots of animals and birds, like heron, egrets, wood storks, alligators, manatees, and even bald eagles. At the Kennedy Space Center, NASA scientists and engineers work on the space shuttle and other programs. What's NASA? NASA stands for National Aeronautics and Space Administration. There are over 150,000 people around the world who make the space program work. NASA launch satellites that do lots of important things. They help forecast the weather and send telephone calls and television programs. NASA scientists also send probes to explore the distant planets so we can learn more about our universe. But NASA is best known for the space shuttle. How does the space shuttle work? The space shuttle is like a big truck that flies into outer space. It can be used over and over again, and it can carry lots of cargo called payloads. The space shuttle can fly into space like a rocket, and the orbiter lands back on Earth like an airplane. How does it do that? First, to get into space, you need a lot of power. The shuttle has three 
three powerful rockets, the main rocket engine and two solid rocket boosters on the sides. They put out over seven and a half million pounds of thrust. That's more power than 258 fighter jets. When the shuttle gets to 30 miles up, its solid rockets run out of fuel and drop off. Where do they go? They have parachutes and land safely in the ocean. The external fuel tank is like a giant thermos bottle. It holds fuel for the shuttle's main rocket engines. When it's empty, it falls back to Earth and burns up in the atmosphere. Why does that happen? Out in space, there is no air to breathe, no wind to fly a kite, and no rain clouds. But our Earth is surrounded by a thin layer of air called the atmosphere. If there was no atmosphere, there could be no life on Earth. See this time-lapse footage of Earth taken from a NASA satellite? Watch the Earth rotate and see how the clouds move over it? That layer of clouds is our atmosphere. When a spacecraft enters the atmosphere at a high speed, the air rubs against it and slows it down. This is called friction and causes heat. Like when you rub your hands together, they get warm. That's friction. Special tiles protect the orbiter and its crew from the heat caused by this friction. During re-entry, that heat can reach over 3,000 degrees, enough to melt metal. See the orbiter coming in for a landing? Its tiles are still glowing hot. How many tiles does it have? The skin of the orbiter is covered with over 24,000 tiles and no two are exactly alike. Each tile has its own number that tells which orbiter it belongs to and where it goes. It's like a giant jigsaw puzzle. The tiles are made of a lightweight silica fiber and baked in an oven. Their shape is designed on a computer Go ahead. Go ahead. and sent to a special machine shop where each tile is made into the exact shape. Then the tiles are painted, marked with their own special number, and waterproofed. Why are they waterproofed? The special tiles are like hard sponges with lots of air pockets, so they can hold a lot of water. Watch! This one tile can hold all this water. If the shuttle was out in the rain, it would soak up so much water, it couldn't take off. Wow! With a waterproof tile, water is not a problem. See? When the tiles are ready, workers glue them carefully into place. If they are a fraction of an inch off, it could cause a big problem. Do tiles ever fall off? An orbiter may lose about 15 to 20 tiles during a mission. When it returns from space, all the tiles are checked and repaired. This is Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, where people train to become astronauts. The first two years, we learn all about the shuttle and how it operates, all the systems, so you really know it inside and out. Uh, the inside of the shuttle is just covered with switches, dials, and knobs inside. And you have to learn where every switch is and what every switch does. Astronauts train all the time. They spend weeks learning how to parachute onto land. And water. That looks like fun. It's also hard work. Here in the pool, astronauts learn how to escape from their parachutes.
They also practice survival in the wild. They even learn how to find wild plants to eat. This is virtual reality training. An astronaut wears a special helmet and gloves that are connected to a computer with a 3D environment. Cool, it's like a giant video game. When the astronaut tilts his head, the picture shifts as if he was really there. An instructor operates the computer and programs different situations. Yes. This training lets the astronauts practice maneuvers in outer space without the danger of being there. I see his hand on the screen. This is the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. Here, astronauts train underwater with their spacesuits in the world's largest swimming pool. Wow, it's big. It is 202 feet long, 102 feet wide, and 40 feet deep. It holds over 6 million gallons of water. Special filters and heaters keep the water at a constant temperature and crystal clear. Underwater, the astronauts work in areas built like a spaceship. Here they learn to move around in their spacesuits. On land, a spacesuit weighs almost 400 pounds. But underwater, it weighs nothing, just like in space. Divers are there for safety. And team leaders in the control rooms monitor the entire operation. Now we're ready for our mission, STS-83. What does STS mean? STS means Space Transportation System. It's another name for the space shuttle. Every mission gets its own number and its own patch. Our flight will be on the orbiter Columbia and feature experiments in the Microgravity Science Laboratory. The crew will consist of seven astronauts. Two will fly the shuttle. Mission Commander James Halsell and Pilot Susan Still. The other astronauts will work in the Microgravity Science Laboratory. Dr. Donald Thomas, Dr. Janet Voss, Dr. Roger Crouch, Dr. Gregory Linteris, and Dr. Michael Gernhardt. Months before the flight, pilots work in shuttle simulators to practice flying and landing the orbiter. I show CDMS SSR 13 complete. They also spend hours flying a special jet that has been built to act just like the orbiter. It's set up exactly like the shuttle with the hand controller and all the dials and whistles and bells and everything is just like in the shuttle and we do practice landings because we don't get to go out and fly the shuttle every day to train to be shuttle pilots, so we have to train in the shuttle training airplane and the simulators that we have here. It even has a computerized heads-up display to help the pilot during landing. It's kind of like a video game in that if you line the little circle up inside the little diamond and all your navigation equipment is working perfectly, it'll take you down to a perfect landing. Mission and payload specialists work in an exact copy of the microgravity science lab. And don't forget to put the plastic cover on top of it, which should be. Yeah. Both the commander and the pilot also practice flying in their T 38 jet trainers.
Kennedy Space Center, all the pieces of the shuttle come together. The solid rocket boosters arrive from Utah. And the giant external fuel tank arrives from Louisiana. They all get put together here in the Vehicle Assembly Building called the VAB. Wow, that's a big building. It's the third largest building in the world. The VAB is more than 55 stories tall. Its floor could hold nine soccer fields all at once. It's so big that the Statue of Liberty could fit right through its front door. Inside is where they put the shuttle together. A shuttle doesn't come as one large piece that you see launching off the pad. It actually has to be built like building blocks. The solid rocket boosters on either side have to be stacked segment by segment. When those are complete, we bring an external tank, lower it in the center and attach it. Now it's time to bring in the orbiter. This is the best known part of the space shuttle. Is there only one? Six orbiters were built. Enterprise, Columbia, Challenger, Discovery, Atlantis, and Endeavor. Enterprise has only been used for landing tests. Challenger and Columbia and their crews were lost in tragic accidents in 1986 and 2003. The active orbiters look alike, but they are all slightly different. This is the Orbiter Columbia. To get ready, it comes here to the Orbiter Processing Facility. The OPF is like a giant garage where crews can work on Columbia around the clock. They check out the spacecraft, they repair and replace parts, and load payloads. This is the microgravity science lab being lowered into the orbiter's payload bay. Crews even fix and clean the windows. NTD Houston flight 212. It's a lot of work to get Columbia ready for its mission. When work is complete, the orbiter is moved out of the OPF over to the VAB. It's a tight squeeze. It's a proud day when the orbiter is ready. Columbia enters the VAB, crews connect a large harness so it can be lifted up and attached to the external fuel tank. This operation, called lift to mate, can take up to 12 hours. Wow, that's a long time. Watch this special time lapse view to see it all happen in less than a minute.
When the orbiter Columbia is connected to the tank and the two boosters, it is known as the space shuttle Columbia. Astronauts keep training for their mission. To learn about the zero gravity of space, they ride in a special Boeing 707 with no seats and padded walls. Cool! The plane flies to a high altitude and then dives to the ground. Everyone inside falls with the plane, so it's like there's no gravity. <laughs> It's kind of like in your car, if you drive over a hill really fast and you get light in your stomach. Well, it's like that in the airplane, except for it happens for about 30 seconds long. <laughs> it's a little similar to being in a swimming pool where you're floating in a swimming pool, but it's different in the fact that there's no resistance. So if you just push off with your finger on the wall, you'll just keep going and going and going and going across the whole airplane if you want. The astronauts also practice emergency exits from the shuttle launch pad, called emergency egress. Why do they do that? In case there was a fire or another problem, they would have to get away fast. They leave the orbiter and get into special baskets on wires that slide down to the ground. Watch. Then they rush to special armored cars and leave the area. This protects them in case of an explosion. Do rockets blow up? In the early days of the space program, some rockets didn't always work. Space travel isn't easy, but the scientists and engineers tried again and again. It took thousands of people years of hard work to put someone on the moon. Lift off. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Turning off four and five. Columbia, all systems are go for What's she doing? Operations. She's a student at Space Camp. This is a special place where young people can learn all about the space program. Students come for a week and live like astronauts. They also go through astronaut training. Wow! Martial ops, the mapping radar is off. They even go on Three, space shuttle two, missions. One, booster ignition. Liftoff, we have liftoff of STS-62. In a real simulator. Piloted go. Roger. APUs running normally. Some operate mission control, while others go on spacewalks. It's a lot of fun. The shuttle on its mobile launcher platform is moved out of the VAB by a giant vehicle called the Crawler Transporter. The Crawler? The Crawler moves the shuttle to the launch site three and a half miles away. This trip takes five to six hours because the Crawler can only go up to one mile per hour. Columbia on its mobile launcher platform weighs over 17 million pounds. It's so heavy that it crushes the gravel into sand. So new gravel has to be put on the road every year. The space shuttle is secured for launch and the crawler moved away. Ready to go. It is now three days before launch. 
the crew flies from Houston to prepare for launch. In these final days, hundreds of people will work day and night to get Columbia and its crew ready to go. It's the day before the launch. The press stands are empty and everything seems quiet. But behind the scenes, there is lots of activity. On the night before the launch, the external fuel tank is filled with super cold liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. This fuel is over 200 degrees below zero and very dangerous. The debris inspection team observes the fueling to make sure there are no problems. Today is launch day. Reporters begin to arrive. People come from far away to watch the launch. The public viewing areas are three and a half miles away. On the launch pad, there is lots of activity. I need somebody to check tiles on the body flap. Somebody we spend two hours starting at the top of the shuttle, working down, looking at every square inch, anything that would prevent a safe liftoff in the next few hours. The astronauts are up, bright and early. We um, get all suited up into our suits. They make sure that the suit seals are good and everything, and now we're, we're going off to the shuttle. All of us come out together and then we get into what we call the Astro Van. The van takes the crew to the space shuttle. On the way, they can see Columbia through the window. It's so impressive looking at this vehicle that's going to carry us into low Earth orbit. And it's just awe-inspiring seeing her sitting there on the launching pad. All around the Space Center, countdown clocks show the time to launch. At T-minus two hours, 45 minutes and counting before the launch of Space Shuttle Columbia. George Diller, the voice of Shuttle Launch Control, keeps everyone informed. Heading for an on-time liftoff at 1.50 p.m. This is Shuttle Launch Control. The astronauts have arrived at the 195-foot level of the fixed service structure where the orbiter access arm is located. The crew enters the White Room, their final stop before they enter the Space Shuttle. Once the astronauts begin getting on, then there are a lot of things that begin to happen where the astronauts are directly involved with the launch team in the firing room. And at that point, systems on board the shuttle really have to be working properly. In the press room, journalists from all over the world come to report on the launch. Veteran shuttle crew member Ray Seddon broke an ankle while training for a record-breaking space mission of her own. NASA notes the one thing both injuries have in common is... This is shuttle launch control at T-minus one hour and counting. The astronauts get strapped in their seats, and last-minute work is done at the launch pad. In the firing room, the launch director checks with key people to make sure everyone is ready for launch. T minus nine minutes and counting. Standing by now to retract the orbiter access arm away from the space shuttle. Pilot Susan Still now reports that the APU activation is complete. We've got hydrazine now flowing from the tanks toward the APUs. T 
T-minus four and one half minutes and counting. Now it's time for everyone to leave the launch area. For safety, the closest anyone can be during launch is three miles away. Helicopters make sure the whole area is clear. Now, Gimbal and three main engines. One minute and counting. We're standing by for the handoff to the onboard computers. In five seconds. Three, two, one. Over auto sequence start. The handoff has occurred. Columbia's computers now controlling. Caution, one amendment clear, non-expected air. T minus 20 seconds. T minus 16 seconds, the sound suppression water system has now been activated. There's birds and stuff right there, and I'm thinking these birds need to move out of the way. <laughs> because we're going, you know. Nine, eight, seven. Ignition sequence start. Five, four, three, two, one, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia with the Microgravity Science Laboratory, our research bridge to the space benefits of tomorrow. You can see the launch tower disappearing off to the side. To me, it feels like a bumpy train ride. A lot of vibration and a little bit of noise, and most of it's behind us. The show part of it is really the best on the ground. We already traveling 300 miles per hour. Columbia's three main engines is now throttled back to two-thirds throttle to prepare the spacecraft capacity area at maximum air pressure to go supersonic. Altitude down two and a half miles, one and a half miles. It's a pretty exciting time when you finally know after a year, two years of training and a lifetime of dreaming, the moment has finally come and you're on your way. One and a half minutes into the flight, Columbia has already used over two million pounds of fuel. It now weighs half as much as it did on the launch pad. Columbia, go and throttle up. Mission Control in Houston now directs the flight of the space shuttle. In good shape. Columbia speed now 1,500 miles per hour. Controller standing by in the next uh, few seconds for burnout and jettison of the twin solid rockets. The boosters jettison off and fall back to Earth. Solid rockets. Recovery ships wait in the Atlantic Ocean. Let's go in. Divers rush out with large underwater hoses to pump air into the hollow boosters. This makes them float like giant balloons. Ships take them back to the Space Center to be used again. Columbia releases the external fuel tank and enters Earth orbit. But flight doesn't last long. There's a problem with one of the fuel cells that provides power to the spacecraft. For safety reasons, NASA has Columbia return early. Main gear touchdown. But the mission will fly again. Dead drag chute deploy. Nose gear touchdown. So Columbia is prepared for launch in record time. Just a few months later, Columbia is back on the launch pad, ready to go on its new mission called STS-94. And MTD, you're clear to launch. I copy. Watch and listen to the launch. I wish you got free, Columbia. Keep the dream alive. Thank you, man. Thanks, and we want to congratulate everybody here at the Cape who made this record-breaking turnaround possible. We'll take good care of the ship and see you in 16 days. Copy. Thank you. 
10, minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Main engine start. Every launch is recorded with over 200 video and film cameras. Greg Katnick examines this footage after every launch. We try to look at everything. The, the films run at high speed, which turns the actual motion of what happened during the launch into slow motion. We can see the thrust build up. We can see the vehicle lifting off the pad. He looks for things that might cause problems, like loose tiles, or leaks in the tanks. His work helps to make sure that every launch is safe. Columbia is once again in space, in Earth orbit. What's an orbit? The force of gravity pulls everything toward the Earth. But if a spaceship moves fast enough and is high enough, it actually falls around the Earth. That is an orbit. The shuttle orbits the Earth at over 17,000 miles per hour. On Earth, on a clear night, you might be able to see it going by. It would look like this. We go around the Earth every uh, 90 minutes. We have 45 minutes of daylight, 45 minutes of nighttime. And during the night passes, we can watch thunderstorms, the lightning going off. There's nothing like looking out the window at the Earth from space. It compares to nothing that you could experience here. It took me by surprise. I'm looking down at the Earth at night, and I saw a shooting star. They enter the atmosphere 40 or 60 miles above the Earth, and we're well above that. So if you want to see a shooting star up in space, you look back at the Earth. Life in a space shuttle is like a camping trip. Astronauts use sleeping bags. And eat freeze-dried food. But of course, there is no gravity. Your mother's always teach you not to play with your food. Well, <laughs> astronauts can't help but play with their food because it floats and it bounces off of things. You can take an M&M and just shoot it across the room at somebody and it'll just float and somersault over there. Zero gravity makes moving around inside the shuttle like swimming through the air. Cool! All the everyday things are a little different when you're in outer space. When you're in space, your heart doesn't have to work very hard because it doesn't have to pump blood against the force of gravity up to your head. It can get pretty lazy. So we took an exercise bike with us and everybody rode the bicycle pretty much every day for about 20 to 35 minutes. and. Um, and that's just to get your heart rate going. The crew keeps in touch with friends and family through email. They even talk to other spaceships. Space Shuttle Mir, Space Shuttle Mir. This is KC-5RNI, Space Shuttle Columbia. I think I'm hearing my call. The Microgravity Science Laboratory is a series of experiments. They go back in a module called the Space Lab module, which is about the size of a small school bus. And we have a tunnel that connects the front part of the shuttle back to the space lab module. Columbia, Houston, Janice and Roger, welcome back to Space Lab. Thanks, Mike. It's good to be back. On STS-94, the crew performed 34 different science experiments. 
On this mission we had a heavy emphasis on science, microgravity science. We were interested in how flames burn in space and how we can process materials in the, in the microgravity environment of space without gravity pulling down on us. Mostly what I did was the fire experiments and you never knew what was going to happen. You didn't know how many little flame balls you were going to get or what they would do and it was really fun. It was like a little Christmas present every time we lit one off. These experiments will help us develop new things like computer chips and medicines that can only be made in the zero gravity of space. Everything looks different when you're 180 miles up. Every free minute I have, I have my nose pressed up against a window looking out. The blue earth is so spectacular. The limb of the earth uh, is almost glowing blue like a fluorescent light. And that's in sharp contrast with the blackness of space right next to the earth. They call it the blue planet and it's just a spectacular you know, planet that we live on, and once you get up and away from it a little bit, you can really appreciate it. From Earth, to see really wonderful things, you need a telescope. desert, astronomers look up at the stars with this giant radio telescope called the Very Large Array. It has 27 dishes that work together and act like one giant antenna. They are so powerful that if you stood on the moon with a remote control, they could easily pick up your signal. Computers in the control room take the radio signals coming from the stars and turn them into pictures. This is an image of a galaxy that is over a hundred trillion miles away from Earth. This work helps scientists better understand our universe. The space program is something that you know, we're here on Earth, but we're very interested in why we're here. And so I think it's just the nature of wanting to, to reach out just the way Columbus wanted to leave Spain. I mean, we're just doing that the same way, only it's in a high technology environment. It's also a wonderful way of keeping the entire human race looking forward to the future and, and seeing that the future is positive and making them feel good about what they're doing and where they're going. We need to be out among the stars. We need to go farther and faster. So eventually, we will expand to our solar system and see everything that's there, and then pretty soon be time to go to the nearest star and see what's out there. The mission is almost over. The commander and the pilot get set to take Columbia out of orbit and prepare for landing. Mission Control in Houston guides the spaceship as it leaves Earth orbit and heads toward the Kennedy Space Center. Time to touch down now, just one minute, 15 seconds. All systems on board, Columbia continue. Landing the orbiter is much more difficult than landing an airplane. The major big difference is there are no engines. So you can't say, I don't like this approach, let's try it again, you get one shot. Yet. I see the lights, so. Columbia on at the 90. Got to be on at the 90. It's very steep, and it's coming down at thousands of feet per minute. Just high on the ball bar. You're down. On final approach to runway 33, Kennedy Space Center, Columbia is now descending at the rate of 165 feet per second. We're going to land a 200,000 pound glider, and we got to get it right the first time, and everybody's watching. Name your touchdown. Commander Jim Halsell brings Columbia in for a perfect landing. Shoot, jettisoning. Thank you. Nice landing. Thank you. Our crew is back home on planet Earth. 
They have traveled over 6 million miles and completed over 30 experiments that have never been done before. Welcome home, Columbia. Congratulations on a perfect mission. And so it's just with satisfaction that we've landed and now we're all looking forward to a shower and a pizza. <laughs> So next time you look up at the night sky, look carefully. You might just see the big space shuttle. I want to be an astronaut. I recommend that anybody that wants to be an astronaut do well in school, study something that they love, and then apply it to the space program. And there is nothing you can do in your life where reading won't be a vital part of learning how to do that job of communicating with other people how they need to do it. And the more you can read and enjoy reading, and the better off you'll be. I had a dream of doing this when I was six years old, and I never let go of that dream. Whether you want to be an astronaut, a, a scientist, a teacher, or a doctor, no matter what it is that you want to be in life, if you work really hard and you dedicate yourself to that, you can make your dream come true, and I'm living proof of that. And one of the kids watching this tape may be the first person to walk on Mars, and I think that would be wonderful. Here's how you can find out more information about topics mentioned in this video. Use your computer and look up these websites. And remember to check out the Little Mammoth website at www.littlemammoth.com. A post office box has been established for those wishing to donate to the Space Shuttle Children's Trust Fund, a nonprofit charitable trust fund established in 1986 to benefit children of the astronauts who died. If you wish to contribute, please send a check or money order to the Space Shuttle Children's Trust Fund in care of the private bank at Bank of America, P.O. Box 34600, Washington, D.C., 20043-4600.